but he's going to tell you, and you'll be the first to hear this story. Um, Garrett has three children. They are six, five, and one. He has a beautiful wife and a wonderful family, and he also played soccer here at Brigham Young University, one of the soccer stars. He still plays a lot of soccer, and he has just had an amazing story of his life since he, uh, since he sold SCAN. He's now known, he and his family, as the Bucket List family. That's right, you all know that. So. <laughs> And uh, so I'm sure that we're going to hear uh, quite a bit about uh, that experience as well. But we're very excited to have Garrett here today. Let's give Garrett a rousing welcome. Thank you to the young man who said the prayer. I especially appreciated the words of hearing the words that are said and the words that are not said. I think that's going to be extremely important today. But before I get started, I have two special treats for you. So earlier today, um, I was super nervous about this presentation, super nervous, um, still feel like I might throw up. <laughs> so to help me calm my own nerves, I decided to start today with a musical number of sorts. So I posted to my Instagram. Are there any musical acts out there that would want to meet me in like two hours at BYU? And I got two stellar responses. So the first that you're going to hear is my now friend, Nadia. You heard her a little bit. Incredible, right? Um, so we'll first hear from her, and then you're going to hear from my new friend, Isaac. And I mean, we met like 15 minutes ago, right? <laughs> um, so you're going to hear them. I'm, I'm excited myself to hear them. And I just, before they go on, want to point out that little lesson in itself, that how cool that I sent out a random message. It was an opportunity. I mean, are you guys nervous? Are you scared? I'd be terrified if I was in your shoes. <laughs> and you should be super nervous. There's a lot of people here. <laughs> are you nervous? We're, we're oh, I'm nervous for you. OK. Anyways, they're not nervous. Um, but I, pff, how cool. And I just respect that from the both of you so much. And I wish all of the success in the world for you because you have that personality trait within you. I think it's going to serve you very well in anything I can ever do to be a part of your future success that I know you will have. I hope to. So first, Nadia. Um, my name is Nadia Christine, and I am a YouTuber that creates music videos for a cause. And so this song is an original that I wrote. Um, we're doing a suicide prevention project right now. And so this song is called Broken, because I feel like there's a lot of times in our lives when life weighs us down and we feel broken. But as we look up, we realize that we actually aren't broken. Here's Broken. <clears throat> Face after face I'm running through it all There's no time to waste Pressure is on With every breath The day is so long When will I rest? When will I rest? Let the world freeze Give me a moment Just let me see that I'm not broken Let the world freeze Give me a moment Just let me see That I'm not broken That I'm not broken Days turned weeks, weeks and years Time seems to leak and soon disappear End of this road, I'll have nothing left The current keeps pulling, I'll drown like the rest I'll drown like the rest Let the world freeze And give me a moment Just let me see that I'm not broken Let the world freeze Give me a moment Just let me see 
that I'm not broken, that I'm not broken. If I'm in pieces, please don't leave me there. Cause just your presence tells me you care. Let the world freeze. Give me a moment. Just let me see that I'm not broken. Let the world freeze. Give me a moment. Just let me see. I'm not broken, so let it freeze. Give me a moment, just let me see. And I'm not broken, cause I'm not broken. That was beautiful. That was amazing. It's just pretty beautiful, right? That was a great song. Garrett, thanks for having us. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a different kind of a music performer. We're going to write a song together right now. So I actually am a music producer in town. And so I'm just going to show you how I do my process. Let me put this in here for a sec. First, make sure this thing sounds good. Okay. All right. So, first, what we're going to do, if someone could give me, actually, I need two people. Someone give me a letter between A and G. F? Okay, what's another letter? B. Okay, cool. So, F. I'm gonna make that a minor. Whoever said B. That's all right. Okay, so. So now what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna use a scale and just fill in the gaps between those two. We're going to do C, B minor, F, do a G. Cool. All right, so next, um, someone give me a topic. Corn. Unicorns. <laughs> Nelly, you would do that. Awesome. Okay, I forgot. I'm going to put a timer on. We're going to see if we can do this in five minutes. So, uh, Does anyone want to suggest anything else? Or do we, what's that? Traveling? Oh, that's an easy one. She gave me an easy out. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'll see if I can merge them. Let's see if we can merge them. All right. Let's see here. And then on the chorus, this last thing, do you want it to go kind of up, down, stay constant? Up? All right, we'll see what we can do. So give me a little bit. We'll see what we can work with here. Can you guys hear this? Yeah, okay. I've been traveling around this town, trying my best to find the ground. Yeah, yeah. hoping to be oh, flying free. What well, is this that I see before me? 
It's a beautiful rainbow, I know. Oh, this is what I've been looking for. Unicorn. Step out this bar and be free again. I've been walking down too many times that road when I was a kid. Completing patterns that I was tied. But you'll take me oh so high. Or oh, you'll take me far away. Yeah. Or oh, you'll take me oh so high. Guys, I've made a terrible mistake. I can't follow that stuff. Jeez. Thought I was nervous before. Yeah. You guys are good. Oh, man. All right. Whew. OK, so have you ever been to either like a teacher or maybe church and some sort of presentation or speech, and they begin with some sort of disclaimer, like, oh, sorry, guys, I just found out last night that I was going to be giving this talk. Sorry, guys, I just found out this morning. Hey, I prepared this last second. Hey, I've been kind of sick, like all those disclaimers. This is the complete opposite. I am super grateful that you're here, and I'm just going to give you my everything. I'm going to tell you a story I've been waiting a really long time to share. Um, and, it, <clears throat> and it means the world to me. So here's the last five years of my life, OK? I was a student here at Brigham Young University. I was playing on the soccer team. I started a company. I built an iPhone app called Scan. And then I sold that app for $54 million to a company called Snapchat. And then I left that company. And my wife and I and our children began to travel the world, started an Instagram and a YouTube called The Bucketless Family, and have since then together in the past four years, visited 78 countries together all around the world. And we're preparing for our next project. So when I've been able to have the opportunity to speak here before, I've shared very often my BYU experience, and I've shared my SCAN experience, how it was to start a company. I've been here before, and I shared the story of like the Bucketless family, why we started the Bucketless family, and, and how it became our careers, how it became a profitable business for us. But I've never had the opportunity to talk about that like taboo middle section. Most of it was for legal reasons. A lot of it's because it was very, very personal to me. But the time is ready. I'm ready to tell it. Uh, I saw my good friends that I've, I've kind of felt sick all day knowing that I was going to share this story. And my new friend Isaac pointed out, he's like, I think it's because it's been weighing down on you, like any secret you keep, and you're finally having the opportunity to share it. I mean, just to give you an idea of how private this story has been, I mean, my parents have never heard this story. Um, a lot of my close, dear friends have never heard this story. Uh, I'd, it might be safe to say that my wife is the only one who truly knows this story. So please don't judge me off of it. Um, I, hope, I hope it comes across the way that I want it to. All I hope to share with you is my intentions and my sincerity. And, and I have the faith that not everyone, because it's a crazy story, but there's going to be a couple of you out there that are hearing this, that understand it, and it's going to, just like me, it's going to change your life. So we'll start with BYU soccer, the brief intro. 
played BYU soccer. I was really good when I was here. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way. Uh, the pictures, the pictures you're going to see, uh, all these pictures from the entire presentation, I just pulled from my journal. And if you don't keep a journal, I'm just going to make one encouragement right now. Like, keep a journal. The amount of value that it has added to my life, I mean, just today, if, if, if you were to ask me, I would say I'm in a very blessed position. I love my life. I love my career, my family. We travel around the world. Like, the situation we've put ourselves in, I would argue that I might have the best life in the entire world, honest speaking. And sometimes I'll get the feeling of, like, why do I deserve this? Like, how did this all happen? And then today, going back through my journal, I could not believe, like, the mess that it took to get here and what I have put into it, and the hard work, and all the friends and family that helped me get here. And the journal showed me, like, no, this is exactly where I should be. This is exactly where I deserve to be. And my friend here in the background is also on the front row. I also found this in my journal. How cool is this text message? You know it meant a lot to me if I screenshot and I added it to my journal. And I remember specifically when he sent this to me and how I was feeling my uh, how I was feeling about myself as a soccer player. And then it was thanks to his friendship and his support through the years that I can now stand here in front of a lot of people and you know, tell people I was, I was probably the best to ever play there. right? But it's thanks to, uh, to friends close to me that I was able to um, take this next step. So then I found this in my journal. Pretty sure I took this from right here. Look, nobody showed up. <laughs> And look at it today, a little bit different, yeah? This, this was, um, I don't know, maybe four years ago, the first time I was on this stage. And I remember I was pitching the idea for SCAN. I was up here and I was telling people, here's my idea. This is when I, what I want to create. Does anybody want to join my business? And nobody was raising their hand. Nobody believed in me. Nobody wanted to join my business. I think I found, see, this is me at the BYU career fair with my sign made out of cardboard and homemade paint. And I was like, guys, I'm going to take this to the stars. Like, come join me. It was, it was difficult to convince people. I was able to convince two kids, two of my buddies, uh, to join me. And I mean, they're millionaires now, so. <laughs> That's good. So me and my two buddies, we created an iPhone app called Scan. Got over 100 million downloads over the three years that it was in existence. Um, here, here's something I found in my journal. Uh, this, this was just so eye-opening to me. I wanted to share with this with you because especially as a student, I remember very well what it felt like where you're, you're young and you have what you maybe feel is right for your life, what you think is right for your life, but you also have your parents, you have your peers, you have BYU, you have the system of the world, you have a lot of outside voices telling you what you should do, what you should become, and how to get there. I feel like a lot of successful people always talk about the system or the man, and it's because so many people, when they reach success, they realize the system had nothing to do with it. If anything, the system was a distraction, or the system almost threw them off their path. Every single one of you is a is a unique individual. And your path that you're going to take to who, who, you're supposed, who you can become is going to be a unique path. So the more you listen to those outside voices, the more you risk going off of your path, right? And when I say outside voices, I mean, I mean the systemic ones that is just telling the broad audience, like, look, this is the way to do it, or this is the way to do it. It's super black and white, and that's not the case. And so I found this screenshot. It was an email from Apple offering to give me a job as a designer. That's like the mecca for any designer doing what I was doing at the time. And I was studying product design here at BYU. And if you were to take me and my classmates, definitely I had the worst grades. But not only that, skill-wise, I was one of the worst designers in the class. Every single one of those kids in there, they were so talented. So not only was I struggling with grades, I was struggling to keep up with their design skills, and yet they were following the rules. They were taking the test, they were doing the projects, they were doing their homework, they were trusting the system, okay? Sorry, BYU, it kind of sounds like I'm telling them not to do their homework. That's exactly what I'm telling you, by the way. So, um, so meanwhile, I was doing my side project. I was building my iPhone app. 
And I remember when this offer came in, it just hit me so hard. And you know, I was excited for myself, but more so, I was sad for my classmates. Because here I was not being a good student, and not like, I wasn't like rebelling on purpose, I was just, I, to, to be honest with you, from my perspective, I was more so lost. It sucked being a bad student, and I hated the fact that I wasn't the best, best designer in the class, and I had really good friends in there, and one of them had emailed me saying, look, I'm, by this time I had left the program. I, you, you have to apply for the first year and the second year, and I didn't make the cut that second year. So I was only part of the design program here for one year. My buddy who went on year after year after year trusting the system, he emailed me saying, I'm about to graduate. That's, my dream would be to work at uh, Apple, and I know you have relationships there. Do you think you could get me an interview for an internship? And so this conversation led to a $10 million offer. When I told them, sorry, I'm a little tied up. I have my own like, startup going. I have my own iPhone app. They said, well, if we paid you $10 million, could you like, shut that down and come work for us? So I'm like, here, I took my own route. I'm being offered $10 million in a job at Apple, and my buddy, who trusted the system, is off asking me, a lesser designer, if I can intro him for an unpaid internship. And I mean, I just took it for what it is, and I care a lot about that friend of mine, and I just kind of made me hate the system, right? Naturally, because that's my dear friend, and he trusted you, and that's what you're going to do to him. You're going to spit him out and just hope that he gets an unpaid internship, even though he's a very talented young man. And so that, that's, I mean, it, it, luckily for me, it just became a pattern in my life where I don't want to necessarily hate the system or mistrust the system, but I'm going to take everything that comes at me in life and I'm going to like look at it for what it really is. All right, so moving forward, the, the, this is me and my buddies in our office here in Provo building our iPhone app. We had built it for three years. We had raised $10 million in funding, and we had had about 100 million downloads. And I'm so glad that I found this specific photo in my journal because if you were to ask me, like the three years of building the iPhone app, it was all just rainbows and unicorns, right? Um, like things were going really well for us. And you know, we'd have like our ups and downs financially, or ups and downs as far as like analytics and downloads were going. But us as just like a core group of buddies, we were having fun. We got along really well. We were on a fun adventure. And as a young man who wasn't ever like super money minded, that's what I cared most about, and that's what we were doing until this meeting. I went to this meeting, and for the first time in the existence of the company, something just fell off. We were arguing, we were fighting, there was like drama in the company. And who cares even about the drama, but just like inside, like a feeling something needed to change. And that's exactly what I, I went home and I told my wife, I said, look, we were in the office today, something was different. I don't know what it is. I hope this isn't like the end for us. I hope we're not gonna crash and burn, but something needs to change. And that was on a Monday. And if I have here, it was the following Sunday. So that meeting was on a Monday. I told my wife something needed to change, but I didn't know what. The following Sunday, I'm here in our apartment in Provo, and I wake up in that bed to an email on my phone. <clears throat> um, so, this email was from the CEO of Snapchat. Had zero relationship with him beforehand. Didn't know him, he didn't know me. And you know, if you, like CEOs like that, of that caliber, they don't just send random emails. It'd be like getting an email from Zuckerberg or email from Steve Jobs. And you know, you just don't get those kind of emails. And so immediately, I'm like double checking. Like, is this an actual email? going to their website, trying like Googling, like is this really from who he says it is, the CEO of Snapchat? And if you can see there, all it says is, hey Garrett, really liking the scan app, not sure where you are based, but would love to talk and meet at your convenience. And so I responded immediately. And I said, thanks so much, it means a lot coming from you, would love to meet anytime. 
And he responded, said, well, let me know the next time you're in LA, we'll do lunch. So I lied to him, and I wrote him back, and I said, I'm going to be in LA this week. <laughs> let's get together. And he wrote back like, oh, that's convenient. Yeah, let's do lunch. <laughs> let's do lunch uh, Tuesday. So I told my wife, like, you got to book a plane ticket. I'm going to LA. I don't know why. Don't know what this is, like, but I'm about to find out. Puffing? I'll tell you later what that means. Going to puffing. I think it's called lying, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. It depends. Okay, so if you were to see that past slide and this slide, these, those two screenshots, I think, are three days apart. This is from the head soccer coach at BYU Hawaii. I didn't expect that email from Snapchat, so I was kind of making plans of my own. I wanted to, for fun, go play one semester of soccer at BYU Hawaii. So the same time I get this email, I get a message from the soccer coach there saying, guess what, pull some strings, you're in. So I wrote him back and I said, I'll be there next week, I'll be there this week for practice, okay? So we're buying a lot of plane tickets this week. <laughs> um, there, here's from my journal, this is a picture I took in the bathroom of the LAX airport right before my meeting with the CEO. Okay. Here I am at BYU Hawaii playing soccer. <laughs> Made the team, same week. Picture was taken the same week. Here I am. Uh, the, the, the offices of Snapchat at the time were right on the beach there in LA. All right, so then we get into the story. Okay, you ready for this? I don't know if I'm ready for this. Um, this is just how it went down, okay? I go to the office, my sister drove me there, and she's like, so what are you doing? And I was like, I'm just taking a meeting, it's nothing too big. And she pulls up, and the, the buildings have no signs. You don't know who you're meeting with, but on the door, there's a small little Snapchat, Snapchat <laughs> ghost. And she's like, who are you meeting with? And I was like, tell you after, see ya. Walk into the meeting. Um, I walk into the meeting, CEO comes out, young guy, my age. And uh, he's like, hey, let's go for a walk along the beach. All right, let's walk. So we're walking along Venice Beach, and like so far, you know what I know. Like I have no idea why he really emailed me. I have like hopes, but I don't know anything. And so we just start chatting, and he just dives right into it and starts asking me all sorts of questions about me, my business, my found, my co-founders, just all the details. I, and you know, in the tech world, ideas are being stolen all the time. Like your knowledge, your secrets, like that's your value but I was just going for it. I was just spilling all my knowledge, anything I knew, anything he asked, I was just telling him flat out. And it got to the point where towards the end of the conversation, he said, so I have an idea. I want to put, my, my iPhone app that I had built while at BYU would scan barcodes and give you the information that was tied to that barcode. Very simple app. And he said, I want to put those barcodes into the Snapchat app. So that if somebody wants to friend each other, they don't have to like, ask for usernames and stuff. They could just scan each other's phone and that quickly become friends. He's like, is that possible? It's like, yeah, that's super easy. Your own team could build that yourselves or me and my team could build that like, by the end of the day. That's super easy. But if I were you, like, this is my space. I know, sadly enough, I know more about barcodes than anyone else in the entire world. <laughs> And the technology is old, busted, and kind of boring. If I were you, I would take today's newer technology and I would reinvent the barcode. If you were to do that, then you would control the entire space. Nobody could read your barcodes, only you could read it. Therefore, you could control it. And so, yeah, to, to friend people, that would be easy. But then you could also do it to empower purchases. Businesses could use it for marketing. Like, the world would be yours and you would control it. And he's like, well, could you do that? So, yeah, it'd take me about three months. And he said, well, I would never ask anyone to sell their business because I would never be willing to sell Snapchat. But would you be willing to uh, sell your business and come join my team? And inside, I, in, inside I was going, yes, for sure. Let's do this. <laughs> but on the outside, I think, I, at least I tried to play it cool. On the outside, it was more like, um, well, you know, I wouldn't sell mine either, but your company is really cool, and I really like you, so I would at least like consider it. And, and we're basically dating, right? We're on a first date. And so, um, you know, trying to play a little bit hard to get, and he's like, okay, 
let's uh, go into the office. There's someone I want you to meet. I walk into the office, and immediately the, a lawyer walks over. And I don't know what he told this lawyer, like what he had up his sleeve, but the lawyer immediately walks up to me and says, congratulations, Garrett. I'm excited to have you on board. And I was like, mm? <laughs> And uh, Evan's like, oh, no, we haven't like, gone that far yet. <laughs> and uh, he's like, OK, OK. Well, have you guys talked about a price? And I, again, I'm just standing there like, oh my gosh, like, this conversation is happening right now. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, he's like, have you, have you guys talked about a price? I look at Evan, and Evan, and he asked me like two questions. He's like, how long have you been working on your business? How much money have you raised? How about 40 million? Stay cool, stay cool. <laughs> Poker face, no one inside. <laughs> um, if I were to best like remember and reenact, it was just like, a, um, yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think that sounds pretty good. I'll have to talk to my team, uh, call my wife. But I think like, and then I said, so I'm new at this. How long does something like this usually take? He was like, oh, most companies this would be like a three month process to get something an acquisition like this done. But you know, we we move quickly. I want to have this done by the weekend. Like, All right. Well, I definitely should call my wife then. She's in Hawaii right now, or I'm supposed to be playing soccer. Um, OK. So that was it. That was my hour-long walk along the beach and meeting at Snapchat. I leave. My dear sister picks me up, and she's driving me back to LAX, where I'm going to get on a plane and go back to Hawaii, because I got soccer practice the next day. OK? So my sister's on, let's see. Oh, yeah, that's how you're feeling when you get offered $40 million. OK, Ooh, this makes me nervous just looking at it. <clears throat> OK, so you can see <laughs> co-founder wife, co-founder, co-founder wife, CEO Snapchat. Uh, it's madness that day. OK, so I'm on my, my, my sister picks me up. I'm in the car. She's like, how did the meeting go? I'm like, oh, pretty good. I just got to call my co-founder real fast. Call Kirk. And he's like, how did it go? And I'm chatting. My sister has no idea what's going on. And he's like, so did they have, like, have a number? And I was like, 40 million. <laughs> and my sister's driving just like, what? <laughs> like, what's going on? Um, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you about it later. I'll tell you about it later. I got to get to the airport. So I get to the airport, OK? I call my lawyer. And my lawyer says, oh, this is, this is wonderful news. I'm going to uh, introduce you to another lawyer. And this is like his bread and butter. He just sold Instagram to Facebook. He sold Oculus Rift to Facebook. Like, this is what he does. He'll take care of you. So that lawyer calls me right away. I'm at, sitting at the gate for my flight to Hawaii. And he says, hi, Garrett. My name is Larry. Um, congratulations. And I was like, oh, like, nothing's done yet. Like, you know, we just had one meeting. And he goes, ah, I've done enough of these. I know how it works. Congratulations. <laughs> he goes, how much did they offer you? I said, 40 million. He goes, OK, so you're going to call him back right now. And you're going to say, OK, so I talked to my lawyer. I, looked at, I talked to my co-founders. I looked at my cap table. And we can't do anything less than 50 million. And I was like, oh, Larry, stop right there. I'm stoked on 40 million. Like, <laughs> we're good. That's sweet. And uh, he's like, you've never done this before, have you? No. Well, this is what I do. Trust me, call them back. They're not going to start with their biggest offer, so just follow my instruction. No joke. So much of me wanted to be like, Larry, can you just call them? Like, <laughs> you clearly know what you're doing. I don't. Like, can you just call them? So whatever. Larry, Larry put it on me. And so I call Evan. And hey, Evan, thank you so much. So fun to meet with you today. I talked to uh, my co-founders and my investors, looked at my cap table, and unfortunately, we can't do anything less than 50. And his response was, oh, that's unfortunate. Well, I wish you the best of luck. We'll talk to you later. And I was like, no! Get Larry back on the phone. Larry, I told you 40 was enough. Like, you had to be all greedy, didn't you? Come on, Larry. And he's like, wait, just wait. Like, I know how this works, and clearly Evan does as well. So just hold. I think he'll call back. And if he doesn't call back in like 20 minutes, then we'll call him back. Like, stay chill. Holy cow, when you're waiting for a flight and you know you've got like 10 minutes before it takes off and this is going on, yeah, that's why I'm feeling a little bit nervous right now. So 